semi-apocalyptic literature students. Welcome to yet another video in which I'm going to walk you through Revelation 6 through 11. You have the home, the, the work due at the end of the week. It's, it should be up on Canvas. Um, and hopefully this will help, help you get through some of the very crazy stuff that goes on in Revelation. Um, the homework itself that is specifically on Revelation 6 through 11 is really just so you can lay out what are all these images and all this stuff going on. Because if you just read it, you can get lost. Hopefully after this little video um, and after reading the, the post that I'm going to link for you uh, and after reading the Bosick book, the Comfort and Protest book, you'll have a better idea of how to interpret it. Now what we're going to do is really, it's almost kind of like a literature class here. We're just going to go through and try to understand what are the images, what's going on, what's the biblical imagery, what's being said, and do it from the point of view of a first century Christian living in Asia Minor. <clears throat> um, once you understand what is going on and what, it, what all this is symbolic of, um, I think you'll be in a better position to, uh, to grasp it all. Okay, so we're just going to dive right in. Chapter 6 starts with the first seven seals that are opened. If you remember back in chapters 4 and 5, this is where the Lamb is worthy enough to take the, the scroll from uh, the one sitting on the throne, and he's going to start opening the seals. And what they are doing, what, is he, what he's doing, he's revealing what God's purposes are in the midst of the suffering of the early Christians in the first century. And so what you see in the first four seals, is they come up right after the other, boom, 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 boom. Um, and actually, let me, let me point this out. What you see in, as you read it, what you, what you should see in the first, in, the, in the, the seven seals and then the seven trumpets, both get laid out in the same fashion as you watch, watch for it. Like here in uh, chapter six, basically chapter six, um, you have the first four come out as a group, four horsemen. And then the, the fifth seal kind of is a standalone, and the sixth seal is a standalone. And then after the sixth seal, there's like an interlude, and that's going to be basically chapter 7. Um, and after chapter 7, you have the seventh seal, and that starts the cycle of the seven trumpets. And when you read those in chapters 8 and 9, the first four trumpets come out, boom, 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 right after the other, like, like a four-unit. Then the fifth trumpet is kind of a unique thing, and the sixth trumpet is a unique thing. And then you get another interlude, which is basically chapter 10. And, at the, and then um, when the final trumpet is sounded, well, not the, well, then, let me back that up. After the interlude of chapter 10, chapter 11 basically sets up that seventh trumpet. So in both the seals and the trumpets, the, the narrative layout is the same. You've got four Five on alone, by itself, six by itself, interlude, seventh. And so there's a definite literary structure to what is laid out. But anyway, the four horsemen in, the, in uh, chapter six, you, you can do the uh, homework. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. You have the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. And when you look at how they're described, <clears throat> and uh, Bosick kind of mentions this briefly in, in his book, but basically what you have to see is these four horses, these four horsemen, represent what the Roman Empire does. And not just the Roman Empire, but any conquering nation throughout human history. But in the first century, they would have seen it as, excuse me, as what the Roman Empire does. The white horse, he goes out to conquer. What did, the, what did Rome do? They went out and conquered with their armies. Then you have the red horse. What's the red horse? Well... If you have a great sword and the ability to take peace away, the red horse is war. So what happens when you go out to conquer? War. And then the black horse, the, the balance is in his hand, the, the voice talking about the prices. In the first century, you would realize those prices are exorbitant amount. Think of like, and, and therefore the black horse represents the poverty that comes as a result of war, especially if you're the defeated nation. You know. Those uh, the prices that are mentioned there, you have to see it as almost kind of like if somebody, if the voice modern modern times would be like you know, fifty dollars for a gallon of milk, 
you know, because of the shortage. And that's often a result of war. Um, the defeated countries go off into depression and whatnot. Think of uh, what happened to Germany after the Treaty of Versailles in World War I. It went to a depression for decades. After the Black Horse, you have the Pale Horse, which is actually death. So the whole point of the first four seals is to kind of reveal the nature of the Roman Empire. When it goes out to war, it always ends up in war, uh, poverty, and ultimately death. That's what the Roman Empire gives people. Now, with the fifth seal, the fifth seal is really interesting. And you have to understand, because this sets up so much else in the rest of Revelation. <clears throat> what John sees in the altar in heaven, up in, up in the temple in heaven, basically, he sees under the altar the souls of the people who have been martyred. Um, now, again, in the ancient, in the Old Testament world, the, the altar is where you offer your sacrifices. So right there, these martyrs are seen as sacrifices. You know, their deaths are seen in a sacrificial way. And they ask God, how much longer until you avenge our blood? And anyway, that's kind of the overarching question that the Christians in the first century would have had. We are being persecuted. When are you going to avenge us and, you know, redeem us? And the answer they're given is kind of difficult. On one hand, they're given white robes, which if you think about it, are purity of the saints, cleanliness, they've been saved, so to speak. But what they're told is they have to wait until the full number of them are killed. So in other words, you know, God is telling them, more of you are going to die. <laughs> and by extension, that's what John is telling the churches of, of Asia Minor in the middle of this Domitian persecution. Uh, some of you, you should expect more of you to die. Um, now, given that, um, let me see my notes here. Um, <clears throat> Given that, so that, that's going to set up the, the overarching, like I said, the overarching, overarching narrative of what comes later. Um, some of them have died, some of them, they should expect more of them to die, but it's seen as a sacrificial uh, death that will eventually bring about God's salvation. And this is one of the things you see, is that in Revelation, the deaths of the martyrs are seen as the means by which God brings his salvation to the world. In that sense, they are very Christ-like. You know, Christ's death brings salvation, and the Christians, they're told to be like Christ to pick up the cross, so their death is going to contribute to God's plan. That's what's being said. Now, the sixth seal is a great earthquake, and here's one of the things you want to note. All throughout Revelation, whenever this kind of language is used, you know, great earthquake, cake, earthquake, earthquake, hail, you know, all that kind of stuff, and it goes back to God's throne room in chapters 4 and 5. Whenever you hear, read this kind of stuff, think God is on the move. God is about to act. So the sixth seal is God getting ready to act. And this day of Yahweh language. And the day of Yahweh is when God's about to vindicate his followers and bring punishment and judgment and wrath to their oppressors. And so this is what you see in the sixth seal. Um, so whenever you hear the earthquake language, think this is a God thing going on, getting ready to happen. Now, the interesting thing here is the kings of the earth are afraid, and they hide, and they say, who can stand, uh, where is it, from, who, who, who's able to stand and, you know, basically deal with the wrath of the Lamb? And this is, gets back to those words I'm, I told you about last time, wrath and tribulation. The kings of the earth, those who oppress God's people, who bring tribulation on God's people, they're going to suffer God's wrath. And so they ask, who is able to stand? And the answer to that very question comes in chapter 7, the interlude. And when you read through it, right after they ask who's able to stand, the first thing we're told in chapter 7, I saw four angels standing. And then later on, John sees a host of uh the, the, the 144,000 standing. These are the people who are able to stand on the day of Yahweh, who are going to be vindicated. That's what's being said. But what is interesting in chapter 7 is there's a big scholarly question about whether or not there are two groups or one group. And I'm going to tell you what I think, and you could read it in my blog post. 
what you see is after the first six seals, there's a little, little interlude, and the angel comes out and basically says, okay, everybody pause until we mark the, the 144,000, the servants of God. Now, this is one of the things you see throughout Revelation because it's going to tie into later on, you know, the mark of the beast. In Revelation, everyone is a servant. Everyone is a slave. You're either going to be a slave of the lamb, servant of the lamb, or a slave slash servant of the beast. In the ancient world, if you were a slave, you, had, you were often marked with the sign of your Lord. And so, here in Revelation, those who follow the lamb, they're going to be marked with the lamb. Later on, those who follow the beast are going to be marked with the beast. So that's all that means. But here's the point. These 144,000 are going to be marked, they're going to be sealed, um, and, and before everything happens. And we're told it's 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel, and you see there's the, the list of the 12 tribes. The significance of the 144,000, it's a mathematical formula. 12 times 12 times 1,000 equals 144,000. So what does that mean? First 12 represent Israel, the 12 tribes. The next 12 represents the 12 apostles who go out to the Gentiles. And the 1,000, it's kind of like the number 7, um, it often is a kind of God's number. So the 144,000, and this is where we go back to the fifth seal, when the martyrs are told you have to wait until the full number of you are killed. This is the full number of what will be the Christian martyrs. And in a sense, they are from the tribes of Israel, but in Christian terms, true Israel is faithful Jews and faithful Gentiles in Christ. That's the true Israel. So the 144,000 basically is a symbolic number that talks, it's about the full number of Christians who are to be martyred. And that's true Israel. Um, and this is why, right after he hears the number in the second part of chapter 7, he looks and he sees a great multitude from all nations. I don't think we should see this as two separate groups. I think the point is the 144,000, the true Israel, the martyrs of the true Israel, come from everywhere. Okay? And so I think that's a key thing to realize. Now, again, um, there are, uh, you know, scholars differ, uh, but it's my class, and that's what I think. If you could read more about it, you can you could research it. But I think that makes the most sense. But here's another thing that um, gives us a clue that these are the full number of the 144,000 uh, martyrs. Because when John asks about them, he is told these are the ones that have come out of the Great Tribulation, the Greek word thlipsis. Um, if you've familiar with uh, Hal Lindsey or Tim Hay Left Behind series, or if you grew up in evangelicalism like I did, you were always taught that, oh, this is the tribulation, and these are the ones who are going to get raptured away from the tribulation, and they're going to escape the tribulation of seven years. Well, that's not what the angel says. The angel tells John, these are the people who have gone through the tribulation, and tribulation is what Christians should expect. And so... Um, these 144,000, they are the martyrs who go through tribulation. And what we're told, if you want to think of it this way, they are essentially like the first fruits. Because of their death, they're going to ensure a full harvest of salvation for the rest of the world and the rest of the believers. That's the focus of this 144,000. When you re read this little scene, in light of the larger narrative of Revelation, particularly Seal 5, you see how it connects. In Seal 5, the martyrs ask how much longer. They're told, wait until the full number happens, until the full number of you are killed. Then, chap then uh, Seal 6, he's about to act. Then there's a timeout. Let's seal the full number. That's how it fits together in Chapter 7. Okay. Now, there's a little bit more that can be said on that there, but you can read that on my blog post. Now, starting with chapter 8, chapters 8 and 9 kind of go together. At the beginning of chapter 8, we're told that there's silence in heaven for about a half hour. And during that time, the incense from the altar, and what altar is that? This is the altar of souls, the martyrs who are praying to God, how much longer? And God is basically listening for a half hour. He kind of like tells everything in heaven, shush, I'm listening to the prayers of the saints. And we're told that after that, after about a half hour, 
as the incense goes up before God, the incense symbolizes the prayers of the saints. An angel takes fire from the altar, puts it in the censer, and he chucks it down to earth. And at that point, that starts the cycle of the trumpets. So in a weird way, the seventh seal begins the seven trumpets. In other words, the seven trumpets are the thing of the seventh seal, if that makes sense. But anyway, when we get to the seven trumpets, again, they get laid out in the very similar pet fashion. The first four trumpets come one after the other. Um, what you should note is they all have echoes of Exodus. Um, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh, there's two parts to it. Vindication of his people, punishment for his enemies. And so the Exodus is a good example of that. In the Exodus, when he redeems the Hebrews from Egypt and they leave Egypt, at the same time of that vindication and salvation, judgment comes upon Egypt. So when God is about to act these to save his people here, these trumpets focus on Exodus language, judgment coming upon the enemies. Now, one other thing I should note um, that I should have noted earlier. Back in the seals, if you noticed, uh, the, the fraction used is a fourth. Uh, it deals with a fourth of things. They, they affect a fourth of things. Here with the trumpets, they affect a third of things. There's another pro fraction progress progression here in Revelation. The seals affected a fourth. The trumpets affect a third. Later on in chapter 10, I'll just jump to that, uh, he hears the voice of seven thunders. Uh, we're told, John is told not to write them, so we don't know what the seven thunders do. But later on in, in Revelation, when we get to uh, the seven bowls of God's wrath, they affect everything. So when you think about that, the seals are fourth, deal with a fourth of things. The trumpets deal with a third of the things. Seven, the thunders, blank, the seven bowls affect everything. So we can kind of assume that if we were told what the seven thunders said, it would have affected like half of whatever it is. But it's kind of, again, it's a literary progression of how things are being told. But in any case, the first four trumpets should evoke echoes of the Exodus. When God is about to save his people, the Exodus judgments are going to come on, on the enemies of God's people. And really, you know, you could, you'll answer that as in the, in the homework, and it should be you know, pretty straightforward. Now, um, with chapter 9, we get the fifth and sixth trumpets, and oh my, are they nutty. When you do the homework, you're going to see what's being described. Basically, the fifth trumpet, there is a fallen star, opens the abyss, and you, as soon as you think fallen star, you're going to think Satan, and that's a good guess. And the abyss is like the sea of chaos, hell, if you will. Um, and locusts come out, and um, we're told that the locusts come out, and they just affect everything, a, a third of everything. Um, and there's a description of the appearance of what they look like. Um, what is going on here? Well, basically... The king of the abyss, we're told, his name is, in Hebrew is Abaddon, in Greek it's Apollyon. What does that mean? It means destroyer, but what does that mean? Here it is in a nutshell. You could read it in more detail in my post that I'm linking. Um, they're not talking about 21st century helicopters. In the first century, the emperor Domitian, he viewed himself as the god Apollo. Apollyon. So it's a word play. And Apollo's animal that is associated with Apollo is a locust. And so in a highly symbolic language, what John is saying here with the fifth trumpet, part of God's punishment on the world for oppressing his people is going to come in the form, ironically, of the Roman emperor is going to destroy things. And Domitian kind of did a lot. So Domitian is the king of the abyss, and he gets his power from the fallen star, which is Satan, basically. He's evil. He's the king of the abyss. He calls himself Apollo, and he just is like a locust, and he destroys things 
in his own empire. All right. Now, again, you could read more about that on, on the post, but now we're going to get to the sixth trumpet. The sixth trumpet, there is a more highly, and what's the word, a bigger image of, of an invading army beyond the Euphrates. Now, you have to know what this is. It's not talking about China or Russia. In the ancient world, Roman, the Roman Empire's key um, enemy at that time was the Parthian Empire, which was beyond the Euphrates. All right? And so the sixth trumpet in that description of that army is basically saying another way God is going to deal with uh, the people who have oppressed his people is not only from Domitian within the Roman Empire, but also he's going to use foreign armies to deal with it as well. <clears throat> now, again, all that highly deep image imagery that's being used, um, don't get too lost in it. Read the, the link to understand a little bit more of it. But the very basic, what you want to see is these seven, these first six trumpets, it's where God is answering the prayers of the saints. The first four trumpets have Exodus imagery. The sixth trumpet, he's going to answer the prayers of the saints, ironically, through Domitian's own destruction, uh, trumpet five, and then trumpet six, four enemy uh, attacks as well. And so that is what is going on. Despite the, the cryptic imagery and stuff, in that context, that's what's going on. Okay? After the sixth trumpet, we get another interlude, same pattern that we saw with the seven seals. And the interlude in chapter 10, it's very simple. Uh, an angel gives uh, John a little scroll, and John has to eat it. Okay? Now, um, this is a prophetic, well, this is a symbolic thing of him being told to prophesy. We get this imagery in, in, in Isaiah when he's called to be a prophet, an angel comes and touches his lips with a coal. Um, Ezekiel eats a scroll, and that's kind of symbolic of his call to, to be a prophet. And so John doing this is kind of the same thing. He's called to, to prophesy. And we're told that when he eats it, it is sweet in his mouth, but it is bitter in his stomach. What does that mean? Well, on one hand, if you're called to be a prophet, that's pretty cool. But the essence of his prophecy is going to be really hard to swallow, so to speak. All right? And so <clears throat> that is basically uh, what chapter 10 is about. It's a little time out of him to prophesy further what's going to happen. Oh, I... Forgot to mention one thing at the end of chapter 9. I'm sorry. Um, at the end of chapter 9, and this is worth noting to understand the narrative, after the first six trumpets happen and all this destruction happens, we're told that the rest of mankind <clears throat> who weren't killed, they didn't give glory to God and they basically held fast to their rebellious rebellion and their idols. So in a sense, these first six trumpets haven't worked. They didn't bring about the repentance of the world. That's why we get this interlude in chapter 10 and what comes next in chapter 11. And in chapter 11, we get a picture of these two witnesses. Um, John is told to measure the temple area. It's going to be trampled uh, for basically three and a half years or 1,260 days or 42 months. It's all the same. That comes from Daniel 9, 24 to 27. I'm not going to go into it here in the video. You can read it in the blog post that I have. Um, it gives a little background. It's easier to read. But we want to get focused on who the two witnesses are. The description of the two witnesses, if you know your Old Testament well enough, you should realize that these two witnesses represent Elijah and Moses. Be able to turn the waters to blood, Moses call down rain from heaven or make it a drought, Elijah. And Elijah and Moses kind of represent the Torah and the prophets. Obviously, Moses represents the Torah. Elijah is like the poster child for the prophets. And so what these two witnesses are is they are bearing witness to Christ as the Lord of all. That's the point. Um, and remember that the, the believers in the first century, the Christians in the first century, were called to bear witness to Christ. And so therefore... These two witnesses symbolize, symbolizing Moses and Elijah really 
these, this is what the believers are to do, okay? And um, we're told that they have the power to do a whole bunch of the stuff. That's why we think they're um, associated with Moses and Elijah. And at this point in chapter 11, we're told that the beast kills them. That's the first mention of the beast. He's going to come later in, in Revelation. But they're killed and they, they, they die and their bodies lay there for three days. And the interesting thing is in the street of the great city that is symbolically called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. That's kind of weird. The, the great city where their Lord was crucified was Jerusalem. But Jerusalem is associated with Sodom and Egypt. Why is that? Well, Sodom is evil. You know, everybody knows Sodom. And Egypt was the place where the Hebrews were oppressed. And so what John is saying is that these witnesses who are killed, who are they being oppressed by in here? They are being oppressed basically not just by the Jews in Jerusalem, but by the whole world. Egypt represents, you know, the whole world. And so everyone is guilty for the crucifixion of Jesus and the persecution of his people. That's kind of the point. Um, after that, they, because they're witnesses to Jesus, after three days, they raise up and they ascend to heaven, and we're told that basically the great the city, there's an earthquake, God is on the move, that what is a third of the city falls, 7,000, a tenth of the city falls, 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. I talk about that a little more in the blog post, um, three and a half days, I guess I should say, not three days. Um, there is some debate over what the one-tenth and 7,000 uh, symbolize. I, I write a lot, little bit about that in the blog post. I don't want to go into it now because I don't want to make this too long. You could read on your own. Um, but the point is that when they are vindicated and they ascend to heaven, further destruction is going to happen here. Um, the end, though, after that, we are told of the seventh trumpet trumpeting. And you can't miss this, because this kind of ends the first major act of Revelation. Revelation kind of comes in two parts, and this is the conclusion to the first act. And I'll explain that more in my next video. Um, now basically, when the seventh trumpet finally blows, after what we just described happens, we're told that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And then we get the picture of the 24 elders praising God. And then in verse 19, God's temple is opened. The Ark of the Covenant is seen. And once again, there's an earthquake and lightning and thunder. and God is working. That's basically the, what the image is of. That ends the first major section of Revelation. And when you look at from chapter 6 all the way to the chapter 11, you see a clear narrative going through. It begins with the souls, um, well, God, you know, the four horsemen, this is what Rome does, the fifth seal, this is what the martyrs are asking, and this is what they're told, and then it progresses from there. It all fits into a first century context of the Christians are asking God, why are we being oppressed by Domitian and the Roman Empire? What are you going to do about it? How how are you going to avenge our blood and eventually redeem all creation? And when you look at all this together, it becomes pretty clear. God's going to bring judgment on their enemies, and he, he's going to redeem them. But the way he's going to eventually redeem all of creation is through their own sacrificial deaths and suffering. You have to go through tribulation before you come to the new creation. That's the message that is here in chapter 6 through 11. All right, so with this video, hopefully it makes more sense. Read the uh, post. That'll further your knowledge. Read the comfort and protest chapter. And obviously read these, uh, do the homework, and you should be good. I think this is due uh, Saturday night, and then we'll just keep trucking through, and we're going to get to the second half of Revelation next week, and that's all about dragons and women clothed with the sun and beasts. It'll be fun. All right, bye.